This is a picture test in practical histology of the gastrointestinal tract. You may use the video as a revision for the topic or as a self-assessment tool. For the purpose of self-assessment, pause the video at the beginning of each slide and take your time in reading the question and coming up with the answer, then replay the video to confirm your answer and listen to further comments and explanations. Identify the layer A and why is the interface B not straight? This is a section of the gut tube showing the four distinct functional layers that characterize the tube. These are the mucosa, submucosa, muscularis externa, and adventitia. The inner layer, marked A, is the mucosa. As you can see here, it consists of three parts, epithelium, lamina propria, and a thin layer of smooth muscle fibers, which is called the muscularis mucosa. The epithelium in this section is stratified sequamous epithelium, non-keratinized. In the gut tube, this type of epithelium is found in the oral cavity, pharynx, esophagus, and anal canal, and it serves as protective. For reasons to be discussed later, this is a section of the esophagus. The undulations between epithelium and connective tissue of the lamina propria, which is reflected in the dotted line B, these undulations increase the surface area of the interface and may provide better attachment and permit forces applied by the formed contents at the surface of the epithelium to be dispersed over a great area of connective tissue. Name the formations A and B. What is their function? The four distinct functional layers of the gut tube are shown in this section. Again, mucosa, submucosa, muscularis externa, and the adventitia. Note that the epithelial lining of the mucosa is simple columnar epithelium with goblet cells. These are characterized by their almost empty cytoplasm. This epithelium is an absorptive epithelium, in fact. The formations to which A belongs are finger-like projections of the mucosa. These are the villi. So a villus increase the surface area of absorption. This is an absorptive epithelium, and there are many structural modifications that increase the surface area for absorption, including the villus. In celiac disease, loss of the normal intestinal villi, like these in A, contributes to the symptoms of malabsorption. In addition to the villi, which are mucosal folds, the larger folds are actually folds of the mucosa and submucosa. You can see here that the blue colored connective tissue of the submucosa is included within the fold B. These folds, they further increase the surface area for absorption, and they are large enough to be noticed by the naked eye as circular folds. They are called plechi circularis or valvuli coniventis or valves of Kerkring. And this is a feature of the small intestine from which this section was prepared. These plechi circularis are particularly numerous in the jejunum. So now the two formations, A, a villus, and B, a circular fold, together with the mic microvilli, and the six meter length of the small intestine, all these four factors, they combine together to provide an enormous surface area for absorption. Identify the space A, name the glands that open into it. This section shows the mucosa of part of the gut tube. Note, the lining epithelium is a simple columnar epithelium which is composed of mucus cells. These cover the luminal surface of the wall and the pits. The columnar cells are packed with cytoplasmic mucigene granules, which are stained poorly by H and E. And this is the lining epithelium of the stomach, where the mucus cells secrete mucus that protects the epithelium from autodigestion. These cells are not in the form of goblet cells. Goblet cells are present in the small intestine. These are mucus, also they are mucus secreting cells, but the uh, material does not accumulate in the form of a goblet. 
Now, as you can see here, that deep to the luminal surface, there are straight tubular glands. These open into the gastric pits. Each pit has, in fact, one to seven gastric glands opening into it. That's why the, the mucosa looks crowded with the cells. To make sure that they are gastric glands, note the parietal cells, which are distinguished along the length of the glands, but they tend to be most numerous in the isthmus of, or the upper part of the gland, which is actually shown in this uh, section. These parietal or oxygenetic cells, they are characterized by their large nucleus, rounded, and they have an extensive eosinophilic cytoplasm. That's why eosinophilic, that's why they are called oxygenetic cells. The nucleus, as you can see here, is not only large, but it is centrally located, so thus giving them a fried egg appearance. These cells are the cells that secrete the gastric acids, and they are a feature of the stomach. So now we are sure that this is the stomach, the space A is a gastric pit, and the glands that open into it are the gastric glands. Identify the surface specialization of the epithelium. What is its function? And list two parts of the gut where you expect to find such surface specializations. Now, this is a simple columnar epithelium. Uh, also, uh, you can see here that there is a goblet cell. Now, the luminal surface of the simple columnar cells is characterized by the presence of microvilli. These are multiple finger-like projections that are clearly seen by electron microscopy. But with the light microscopy, the microvilli constitute what is called a brush border. So what we are seeing here is a brush border. We cannot distinguish the microvilli, but the brush border indicate the presence of the microvilli. Microvilli, as such, they can only be seen in electron microscopy. Now, the microvilli increase the surface area of absorption. Thus, such a feature is present where absorption takes place. So they are a feature of the small intestine and the large intestine. Another site is the lining of the gallbladder, where absorption is also required for concentration of bile. Which arrow, A or B, represents the direction of blood flow in this organ? removal of which cytoplasmic content or contents during tissue preparation results in the multiple empty spaces that are seen in the cells magnified in C. The section shows parts of the classical structural unit of the liver, the hepatic lobule. The hepatic lobule is roughly hexagonal. You can see the periphery here of some of the hepatic lobules like this one. This is another one here, another hepatic lobule coming. And this is the fourth hepatic lobule shown here. In a lower magnification, most of the hepatic lobules will appear as hexagons like this. And this hexagonal lobule is outlined by connective tissue. And all is arranged around a centrilobular venule, which is also called a central vein. The portal tracts are positioned at the angle of the hexagon. You can see clearly one of them here. That's a region of a portal tract. And this tract contains three main structures. Uh, hence the name, also it's called a portal triad. It contains terminations of a portal vein. I'm drawing it here in blue. A hepatic artery in red and a bile duct in green. These are the three main contents of the portal triad. Remember that the liver has a dual blood supply from the portal vein, which is rich in products of digestion, and from the hepatic artery, which is rich in oxygen. The blood flows from the portal tract to the central vein. So the blood here, whether it is the blood of the portal veins, flows in this direction, portal blood, or arterial blood. 
and it actually it flows in the sinusoids until it reaches the central vein. These sinusoids, as you can see here, are located in between plates of hepatocytes so that these hepatocytes are exposed to blood in the sinusoids. And the blood in the sinusoids is thus in intimate contact with the hepatocytes for exchange of nutrients and metabolic products. Thus, direction A is the direction of blood flow, while direction B represents the direction of bile flow, not in the sinusoids, the sinusoids are for the blood, but the bile flows in an, a very tiny system of biliary canaliculi. These biliary canaliculi at the portal triad, they join the bile ductules, which are shown here in green, and these will carry the bile in the opposite direction from the liver to the duodenum. So direction B represents the direction of the flow of bile, while direction A represents the direction of the flow of blood. Now moving to the second part of the question, removal of which cytoplasmic contents during tissue preparation results in the multiple empty spaces in the cytoplasm of the cells magnified in C. When well nourished, the cytoplasm of hepatocytes stores significant quantities of glycogen and lipid. These, both of them, the glycogen and lipid, these are partially removed during routine histological preparations, thus leaving irregular, unstained areas within the cytoplasm. Identify the cells A. How would you describe their precise location and what is their function? First, let's identify the organ. This section shows the mucosa of part of the gut tube. You can see the lining epithelium is a simple columnar epithelium. In this stain, which also contains pass periodic acid shift, pass stains most complex carbohydrates, including mucines. This stain, the pass stain, therefore shows that the simple columnar epithelium is composed of mucus cells, which cover the luminal surface of the wall and the pits. These columnar cells are packed with cytoplasmic mucigene granules that they will take the deep magenta color and this is the lining epithelium of the stomach where the mucus cells secrete mucus that protects the epithelium from autodigestion. In addition to the fact that it also contains protective carbohydrates to neutralize the acidity of the stomach. Now deep to the luminal surface, there are straight tubular glands that open into gastric pits. To make sure that these are gastric glands, note the parietal cells, which are distributed along the length of the gland, but tend to be most numerous in the isthmus or the upper part of the gland. You can see one of them here, for example. A large cell with a large centrally located nucleus giving it a fried egg appearance. This is another one, another parietal cell or oxygenetic cell. Multiple of these, they are present in the upper part of the gastric gland. So far, we have concluded that this is a gastric gland. The dark green cells marked A are therefore located towards the bases of the gastric glands. Now looking closer, note that they have a basally located nucleus also note that they have granules in the apical part of the cytoplasm. And these granules are darkly stained. The granules reflect their large content of ribosomes. These are the chief cells or peptic cells or zymogenic cells. Different names for the same structure, chief, peptic or zymogenic, and they secrete pepsinogen. Pepsinogen among mixing with the hydrochloric acid of the gastric juice, pepsinogen activates to become pepsin, an enzyme that breaks down proteins into smaller peptides. These are again, they are columnar cells, characteristically they are present in the base of the gastric glands. And their nuclei are toward the base of the cell and the apical cytoplasm is granular. That is how you differentiate them from the parietal cells, 
which are present in the isthmus or upper part of the gland. These are large cells with a centrally located nucleus.